Good evening. Welcome to Bible Doctrine. Our dear friends on Zoom, good to see you. Yep, a couple of you can uh, hear me, so you give me thumbs up. Glad for that. Uh, beautiful day post-resurrection, uh, and and uh, we're just grateful for Jesus more and more every day, right, everybody? Yep. So thanks for uh, joining us tonight. We're in Chapter 48 tonight. Let's uh, begin with a, a word of prayer together, please. Gracious Father, thanks for uh, this beautiful day that we've had all week long, Lord, this uh, little bit of untimely early spring weather. Thank you for that. A little bit of rain to make the grass even turn green. God, I'm just mindful of your faithfulness because you said uh, you were in control and in charge of seasons, summer and winter and day and night and cold and heat. You said that in Holy Scripture, and and we see the season changing from our winter into our our spring. That is you. That is you. Your hand is all over our world, God. Uh, with eyes of faith, we behold you, even this night, even right now. And we thank you for the privilege of calling on your holy name. Thank you for gathering us to our Zoom friends and our live friends for Bible doctrine. Um, please, Father, send your Holy Spirit in great measure that our hearts would uh, feel the beat of Jesus and your precious word. And our lives would be filled more with the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish your holy will, Lord. We thank you for this uh, post-Easter, uh, post-resurrection season. And we marvel, Jesus, um, at the power that is in you as true God to be able to, to raise yourself from the dead and to leave a closed, sealed tomb and to show your power over death and over Satan and over sin uh, and over all things. You are Lord, and all authority is in your hands. So uh, please, we ask for your presence and your blessing tonight as we turn uh, to the Holy Word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, hopefully everybody's got uh, a, do a doodle sheet uh, in front of you, right? There are extras over here on the to my left on the table. There are extra copies if you didn't get one at your table site. And by all means, if you want a brown chair, don't let them sit empty. Uh, but most of the brown chairs were evacuated for worship upstairs. And we only have limited uh, br uh, brown chairs down here now. But I, I see two empty tables with brown chairs. Grab them if you like. Okay. But, you know, by all means, don't leave without saying goodbye. Oh, now that's on the video. Man, it's a good thing I didn't say his name, right? <laughs> Everybody a wonder who watches this video later. It's like, who's he talking about? Chapter 48, the means of grace uh, within the church. The means of grace within the church. This was the class pick. Oh, surprise. The class pick. Uh, this was the one that uh, last fall, uh, you know, we just did a little class vote because I had to fill in a week. And this was the one that um, you folks picked. Uh, primarily as the one that you wanted to look at this week. It's a great chapter. I hope you enjoy the reading. Let's ask two questions to get started, please, with our, our live class uh, to help us answer. First of all, we're, we're looking at the means of grace within the church. What is grace? Let's start with the word grace. Let's not take uh, for granted, you know, some obvious church words, right? What is grace? Okay, we hear uh, unmerited favor, and, and where does this, uh, let's not, um, uh, well, let's be obvious. Where does, the, where does unmerited favor come from? Right, we, we've got to make sure we understand that too. This is God's disposition toward us, um, uh, his favor, right, his grace. Um, so grace is something you can go to, to uh, pick and save and get on, on row number three. Nope, folks, it's not a commodity that you touch, that you handle, that you buy. See, it's not a commodity. Saving grace is a gift, right? It's a gift. You can't do anything. You can't look good enough to get saving grace. It's a gift. We looked at salvation, of course, a long time ago. So when we look at this unique phrase, the means of grace we are not talking tonight about salvation, the means of how to get that, because then you're in the wrong class, you're in the wrong denomination, you're in the wrong doctrine, right? Because Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, 
It's a gift of God, not by any works you can do. So folks, please understand tonight, it's not about saving grace. We're talking about means of grace. In other words, how to have more of Jesus in your life after salvation. Tonight is about after salvation. Okay, it's not about starting the Christian life. It's about every minute after the Christian life. So please make sure that that you can, in your head, differentiate that, right? So when we're talking about grace, the next question is, how do I get more of God's unmerited favor after I'm saved? How do I get that? That's the second question. Um, you get it by walking closely with Christ. Being in his word, um, applying his word to your life, you know, making the sacrifices and the changes you need to be more like him. Excellent. Um, the response was, of course, to be more like Christ. I'm going to do certain uh, disciplines or certain behaviors, walking with Jesus to be more like him. So that's why we the, the phrase then, the means of grace. Brothers and sisters, if you weren't sure why you came to Bible Doctrine class tonight, he, here's what I pray is the, is the end result, truthfully. Because it's like, if, if this doesn't happen, we, we ought to all hang it up. When I leave tonight, I, I want more of Jesus in me, which affects my thinking and my feeling and my decision-making. And if that is not a, a literal, realistic goal after this class, what are we doing? What are we doing, Right. So, so bear in mind, grace is not a commodity. You go to a Bible study class and you grab a bag full of it. The means of grace are ways for me to get closer to Jesus. Closer, that's our goal tonight. It, it, it's our goal every Wednesday night. It's, it's your goal every time you open the Holy Scriptures, you see. And, and you might say, well, I can go outside and smell the roses and look at, you know, things um, bulbs that are, you know, popping up and, and, and that's amazing to see God's creation and, and leaves coming out of trees, you know, where the tree is dead all winter long, right? Th that's a means of drawing close to God outside of the church. We're not talking about those, you know, that's why we are together. We want to draw closer to Jesus. I want my life to have more Jesus in it. Is that your goal tonight? Then you're in the right place because that's what we want to uncover. The means of having more of Jesus in my life. Anybody want that tonight then? No. The means of having more of Jesus. So there is a there is a roll up your sleeve element to tonight, which is very unique because many of our Bible doctrines were talking about what God does to us and what he alone can do, such as saving grace. He alone can do that. You, you can't bargain with God. You can't buy it and, and Visa MasterCard just doesn't work. Right. But now I'm rolling up my sleeves and and we have some opening scriptures that that we're going to use tonight uh, to remind us of the fact that in the Christian walk, in the Christian life, it doesn't happen. You don't get more like Jesus just sitting on your couch at home, rolling up your sleeves and saying, Jesus, I want to draw closer to you. OK, so uh, only God can give saving grace. I hope we've got that straight. But a believer pursues God. Every born-again believer pursues God in various means, thus the phrase means of grace. Does, does that make sense to everybody? Pursuing God. This is very intentional, and this is very deliberate. Becoming like Christ is not just osmosis. You sit at home, and you hope you get more like Jesus. It's intentional, and it's deliberate, uh, on the part of every God-fearing man and woman, okay? So God's grace and God's blessings are always going to affect me. They're always going to change me. And my caution tonight as we get started, brothers and sisters, please be careful. Do not look for God's blessing like a slot machine. What do I mean? Okay, you know, you just pull the handle and out comes a couple of lemons and a couple of cherries, God's grace and blessing isn't like a slot machine. It's not like fast food. You go into Mickey D's or you go into uh, um, A&W and you, you, know, you go to Dairy Queen and you drive through and fast food, it comes out of a window. 
you know, God's grace and blessing. Don't look at it that way, because I think that's really dangerous, because then what often happens when people view God's blessing is just pull the handle, say a quickie prayer to Jesus, and all of a sudden a yummy comes out. What happens to the folks who don't receive the yummy when they pull the God handle and say a quickie prayer? What happens to those folks? Sometimes they give up. I heard somebody say it back there. They give up. It doesn't work. That's what I hear so often from people. The God thing doesn't work. Well, I got to check to see if you're safe, first of all, because that'd be a reason why it doesn't work. But secondly, if you're treating God like a slot machine handle, say, God, I need a blessing here. You know, um, bear in mind, sometimes um, it, it, it God just works on a different timetable for that. Okay. So here we go. Letter A. Have you got your text in front of you? We're only going to use minimal of it. And if you don't have one with you tonight, there's still an extra copy here to my right um, that can be used. So letter A, Grudem, page 950, um, asks the first question, how many means of grace are available to us? Before we answer how many, let's just look at his definition of means of grace. You'll find it in the third complete paragraph under letter A. It's italicized. Can you find it in your text? Everybody on Zoom too? Okay. So here's his definition of the means of grace. The means of grace are any activities within the fellowship of the church that God uses to give more grace to Christians. And bear in mind, grace again is not a commodity that you taste, touch, or feel. It's more of Jesus. More of Jesus. See, grace is not, is it, it's not detached either from Jesus. This is getting more of Jesus active in my uh, particular life. So another person defined the means of grace as how God's spirit grows us in Christ likeness, how he grows us to be more and more like Jesus. So this topic uniquely tonight overlaps uh, one other doctrine we already covered, which is the doctrine of sanctification. So the means of grace, how do I become more like Jesus? This, this topic, the means of grace, overlaps with the doctrine of sanctification, which was chapter 38. And, and power already changed tonight. Who's going to change the batteries uh, for me? Somebody's got to do that because I see something's blinking there. Also, this topic tonight uniquely um, is under the category of Christian disciplines. Christian, I think you first shut that uh, speaker off. Okay, front the front the button on the front right. But nope, you're I'll on the wrong side. Oh. Yeah, button front right. Push that off. Number two, turn the switch off on that blinking thing, and then pull it straight out. And here's some batteries. Thanks for taking care of that, Mr. D. Some batteries. Yeah. I made the cut. Oh, actually. None of these will fit because as you take that out, you'll have to go to the double door closet by the copy machine okay. with this key. Okay. And you look pretty much straight ahead at eye level. There'll be a whole uh, palette of AAA. Thanks. Thanks, folks. Here we go. So uh, let's get your Bibles out. Everybody got a Bible to look at? Everybody? I've added a couple. Do you see them on your outline? Um, that we're going to look at. These are my added passages tonight. Um, and they're way at the top under letter A, Genesis 32 and following. Do you see them? So we're, we're the, these are, for me, key passages tonight in how the means of grace. How does this work? How do I get more of Jesus in my life? Here we go. Have you found Genesis 32 in your Bibles, everybody? Genesis 32. Here we go. This one is so key for me personally in my life, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about that, you know, with you as, you as you find it. Give me a thumbs up if you found it, Genesis 32. Okay, super, super. This is Jacob who's wrestling with God. This text, this is, a, this is just powerful in this context. Jace, Jacob is wrestling with God. Look at verse 26. I'm, I may be in the, yeah, I'm at the middle or the end of the verse. Jacob said, he's wrestling with this, this divine being. We believe this is pre-incarnate Christ he's wrestling with, okay? At the end of verse 26, Jacob says, I will not, do you see it? 
What? I will not what, Jacob says. Unless, folks, don't treat God in his great like a slot machine. If he doesn't bless you right away, you give up and God doesn't work. Jacob is the example of a man who wrestled with God and he would not let go of God until he received grace and blessing from God. This is a powerful example, Christians. In my personal life, without sharing any more hairy details of this, there, there's a blessing I've been seeking for God for years. I mean, maybe I'm stupid at it, the Christian walk thing, but it's agonized me because for years I haven't found God's answer and God's blessing. But this text reminds me, do not stop short. Do not, uh, the next one to the right, next one to the right. Don't stop short. Hang on to Jesus until he blesses you. This, this principle is just critically important. Some of you may be waiting. And then is that the speaker back on again? Yep. The speaker? Is it actually working uh, yeah. soon? Yeah. Thanks. So thank you for that, sir. Thanks for the service. So don't let go unless you bless me. Now, verse 28. Look at verse 28. Same chapter, Genesis 32, 28. Then the man said, this is the, the pre-incarnate Christ he's wrestling with. Some people think it was just maybe a, a archangel Michael or so forth. So I, I won't argue that. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Now the name Israel means struggle or wrestle with God. D does everybody know that? Do you know the whole nation of Israel to this day is still struggling with God and with men too, by the way. But verse 28, then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have, here's your key word. What does your translation say? Striven. That's sweat, brothers and sisters. Any other word? Struggled? Availed. Fought. Availed. Folks, this is the Christian life. It, it, after the gift of salvation, there, there's a struggle to be like Christ. Number one, I'm fighting against my... My sinful flesh, always, it's all, I wake up with it, for heaven's sake, right? Can I be apart from it? This does not want me to be like Jesus. All day long, it's a struggle. All day long, right? But Jacob is the principle to remind me. But read carefully, because the verse isn't over. Because you have struggled with God and with men. Notice your struggle will be on two, lo two locations, God and with men. Sometimes you may not be able to discern who your primary struggle is with. Don't be upset about that. But I'm excited about the last word in the verse, if it's the same in your verse. Prevailed. Overcome. That's what I want to be in my Christian walk. I am not going to let go of Jesus until he blesses me. And that, brothers and sisters, I, I don't want to discourage anyone. It may be years. Don't treat God like a slot machine. Like, oh, I got it now. Robert really made it clear. And I'm going to get a yummy from you. And it all comes a little treat. And then you walk on your merry way. And Satan finds somebody who's unprotected. See? This passage, so, has been a blessing. Now, I'm, I'm very interested in the NIV's translation of the word overcome. Do you know a book at the end of scripture which uses that term frequently? Overcome. People who are called to overcome. Uh, yes, maybe, but I'm thinking. Revelation. Revelation chapter two and three. Every letter to the churches. He who overcomes. He who overcomes. He who overcomes seven times. Brothers and sisters, there's work in the Christian life, and there's overcoming all kinds of obstacles, and we need God's presence to make that happen. We need the filling of God in us every day of our, our life uh, uh, until we overcome, until you cross the finish line and get to glory, okay? Now, hang on to that verse and go, please, to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. This is getting better. Anybody want to do a cartwheel yet? No, go to First Corinthians nine twenty four to twenty seven. I don't. Maybe uh, Faye, were you maybe thinking about this set of verses? I'm not sure. This one is is loaded as well too. The means of grace. How does it work in the Christian life? The means of grace. That's what we're asking. We're introducing the topic tonight. 
Have you found your place? First Corinthians 9, 24. Ever, so far, so good. I see. Great. Pages have stopped turning. Here we go. This is Paul speaking. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? And every, every Christian says, duh. He's using an illustration from the Olympic Games. Verse 25. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't finish 24. Here's the admonition to you tonight. What, what does it say at the end of 24? This is great. Run in such a way that you get it. Are you a lazy Christian? Tonight you can't be because you're not going to. Now, this is not. Be careful. This is not a study in the context of salvation. The prize in this text is not salvation. You've already gained it in Christ. He gave you saving grace. This is a text on rewards and blessings. So do not be confused because otherwise you'll use this text to say, I can work to get salvation. If I do the right things, do you see how well, that doctrine is? Okay, be really careful. This is not a context of salvation. Run in such a way as to get the rewards and the prize that God gives you at the end of the Christian life. If you're a lazy Christian, you ain't getting the prizes. You're, you're going to come up short. Your, your wood, hay, and straw is going to be burned up. That's from previous chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 3. Do you get it? So there, you've got to roll up your sleeves, brothers and sisters, because being Christ-like is not pulling a slot machine. It's like, oh, this is easy. He says, run in such a way as to get the prize. Verse 25. Look at some key words here with me. Everyone who competes. Do you have the, the verb competes, everybody? Verse 25. This is the, the same word in the New Testament. Well, the Greek verb is everybody who agonizes in the race. This connects with the verb struggled from Genesis chapter 32, that Jacob struggled with God and with men and overcame. I'm connecting words, one from the Old Testament struggle, now one from the New Testament. Everyone who competes, the NIV gave it a general tone, competes. Folks, if you're not the best, you don't win the final four. Baylor won the final four because they worked at it the best. Do you get the point? Gonzaga was a great team as well, too, undefeated. But something in that game, they did not execute correctly in order to win the prize. Do you get the point? Folks, in the Christian life, they run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes, the verb is agonizes. Everyone who agonizes in the games goes into, here's your term. What does it say? strict training. That's where means of grace come in. What are you doing to bring more of Christ into your life so that your race is more effective? Do you get the point? What are you doing? You know, I said, oh, I'm coming to Robert's study. Well, that's really good. I'm coming to Sunday church. Well, that's really good. What, what are you doing the hundred other hundred hours of the week? Fishing. Oh, that's a low blow. <laughs> that's a low blow. Strike that from the video record. Even though nobody does, it'll be there forever, right? Run in such ways to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Are you doing that? See, I, I, are you doing that? Are you increasing your game in being like Christ? Are you increasing your game? See, what are you doing? If you're doing the same things, I'm concerned that it's a slot machine that you're really pulling. If you're acting the same way in the Christian life, it's like a slot machine. What are you doing? Strict training means that you're going to excel and overcome. Okay. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Verse 26. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. Brothers and sisters, are you running aimlessly. What are you running for? Do, do you get the point? This, this is so practical. It hurts, right? What is your goal 24 seven? What is your goal? Don't run aimlessly. That is not the Christian life. You've got to have a purpose and you've got to be strict discipline and training. You know what? I mean, I love barbecue potato chips. But if I eat those all day long, how's that going to affect my race? You get the point. 
you get the point, right? Don't run aimlessly. Number two, verse 26. I do not fight like a man beating the air, right? Shadow boxing. Paul even uses that picture, shadow boxing. You know, I guys do that in a mirror to see how fit they are, you know, because they can see themselves in the mirror. That, that's not the point of, of Christian race. It's the shadow box. It is to engage with God so that you have more of Christ, which enables you uh, to live for him. Verse 27, no. This one scares me sometimes. Be careful here. Don't take verse 27 wrong. I beat my body and make it my slave. Be careful. That's not flagellation or whipping yourself. See, don't miss, don't make scripture say some wicked things either, right? I beat my body. But you, you know what? I'll tell you every time. This does not want to be more like Jesus. Don't expect that it ever will. If you're, if you're not working against your flesh, you're losing. You're losing. If you're not working against your mind and having your mind be conformed to Christ, transformed to Christ, you're losing. Your heart and its desires, it's, de- it's deceitful above all things. You're losing if you're in neutral. You're going backwards. So the spiritual life is, it is a, a discipline of your mind and your body in order that it can conform to Jesus, right? Conform to the image of Christ. I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Philippians 2.12. Philippians 2.12. We looked at this verse, so turn to that one. We've looked at this several lessons ago. I'm going to bring it back. And then we have Colossians 1.29. You can already find your place there too if you care to. Philippians 2.12. I'm interested in, of course, the admonition Paul gives us here. Continue, Philippians 2.12, to work out your salvation. Now you say, well, there, Robert, you just messed me up because the word salvation there then means I must have to work to get my salvation. Paul, in this context, I believe, is using that word as a summary word of the entire Christian life, the entire Christian life. But notice he used a very active verb, work out, roll up your sleeves and get busy. Do it with fear and trembling. Now, turn to Colossians 129 in conjunction with Philippians 2.12. So you're going to keep this in mind. Work out your salvation. Work out your Christian life day by day, Paul is saying. Work it out, okay, uh, with fear and trembling. Did you find Colossians just a couple pages later, right? Right? Colossians 1.29. This is cool. Are you ready? Paul says, Colossians 1.29, to this end, I labor. Do do you see the connection to the verbs? Work out your salvation. To this end, I work it out. Do do you see the connection of verbs? I'm, I'm trying to help knit together here. To this end, I labor. Struggling. Do you have that participle then? Colossians 1.29, struggling is the Greek verb again, agonizing. Folks, If you're not sweating in the Christian life, I wonder what we're doing, you see? To this end, I labor, struggling with all of whose energy? With God's, you see? So even if if you you take Philippians 2, 12 in a different way, work out your salvation, it's with his energy. This is the Greek verb energia, which is where we get the English word energy. Folks, the power of Christ in you is what enables me, of course, to be more like Jesus. So I need to couple my life. I need to connect my life with Christ on a regular and constant basis because I will struggle. I will do the work of the Christian uh, walk with all of the energy that God so powerfully provides or works in me. Okay? You are not on your own in the Christian walk. You're not. So Colossians 129, draw on the limitless power of Jesus. Who wants some of that tonight? The limitless power of Jesus. Okay, there ought to be every one of us with a a hand going, I want more of his power working me. Now we're to the point. That's what the means of grace are all about. That's what the means of grace. I want more of the presence 
and the favor and the blessing of Jesus in my life on a moment by moment basis. Okay. So now we ask the question that uh, Grudem began under letter A, how many means of grace are there? Did you find an answer to that? Anybody? He, he gave a couple answers, actually. How many means of grace are there? On page 950, uh, uh, you might look at footnote number one. Uh, footnote number one, did that say right there that uh, Louis Burkhoff, which is a Dutch reformed guy, uh, says how many means of grace are there? Objective channels, footnote number one. Three. Three. And they are? Great. And, and this, the content of preaching or what, what, where, where does preaching come from? The word. Those are the three. So many traditional reformed evangelical folks said there's only three ways that you can have more of Jesus in your life. The word of God, baptism as the initial entrance into the Christian life. You're already saved you know, at baptism, and then finally the Lord's Supper. So baptism is a one-shot deal. The Word of God is an every day, every moment deal. And then the Lord's Supper, as often as you have it, take it, right? Jesus says. So baptism is not repeated, but the first two are very repetitive, right? The Word of God, the use of it, and so forth. Now, if you grew up Roman Catholic, how many sacraments or means of grace does the Roman Catholic Church say, say there are? Seven. seven you read that i hope but you remembered it. remembered it yeah you're looking friends on page 951 possibly in some text it may be on the top of 952 the seven listed in the roman catholic church are baptism confirmation eucharist lord's supper penance extreme unction or last rites for dying people holy orders for priests and matrimony getting married. So the Catholic church has, and to this day, uh, they still say those are the seven ways that God brings his blessing, his grace, and his favor to you. Um, and, and we're not going to be looking or studying that list uh, particularly tonight. Now, Grudem himself lists how many on the top of 951? 11. 11. So Grudem takes a little bit of a wider definition of means of grace, and I, I'm thankful for that because now we're going to do a little work together. We're going to do small group work together, and we're going to uh, look at uh, some of these means of grace, okay? Some of these means of grace. So our approach tonight will be that the Zoom friends pick one of the 11 listed on page 951 at the top, and then I'm going to give Zoom the chance to pick first. Then each table also right now, fight it out, but pick your first, second, and third choice. Because bear in mind, one of the tables before you might have picked the one you wanted. <laughs> so each table is going to be a small group tonight where you choose one of the 11 means of grace, except one here's, you my, guys here's my want? only condition. We're going to do number one Which and one 11 do you guys together. Want? So you only have between two and 10. Which from. one of the 11? So each want. table will pick a different one and look at that and we'll answer some questions about it. Okay, here's how it'll work. There's going to be four key questions I want you to discuss at your table once you've picked your means of grace. What's key question number one? That's on your outline. What's my part in this means of grace? What's my part in uh, baptism, the Lord's Supper, prayer, or whichever one you pick? What's my part? What do I do? In this, number two key question, what blessings come to me in this mean of, means of grace? Number three, if I'm not blessed, what's the reason that I'm not? So this is discussion you're going to do at your table. And finally, uh, key question number four will be personal evaluation for yourself. This will not be shared, except that you want to share it at your table. Key question number four, how's my progress in this particular means of grace. In other words, uh, in in the uh, the first one, number one, the word of God. How's my progress in the word of God as a means of grace? And I gave you five, uh, in a, a continuum, an arrow, a continuum, and five possible answers, although number five is not on the chart, because if it is, you're dead. 
If you think you're in glory with this particular means of grace, you are dead, which means you have no more growth to, to do, do you get the point? So I did not put a number five on any arrow, but you can put a pencil mark, a slash mark. You can be at 1.2. You can be at 2.5. That doesn't matter to me. I want though everybody to evaluate where I'm at, because if you don't, then you will never grow. You'll never grow. If you don't know where you're currently at with this reception of Jesus in this particular means, you'll never grow. So number one, I'm just starting out. Number two, I'm making progress. I'll let you determine what that means to you. Number three, full steam ahead. I'm excited about this means of grace. I'm using it every day and Jesus is blessing me every day. Number four, I am now leading or teaching a ministry where other people are growing in this means. Do you get the point? So you, you're, this is your own personal evaluation because if we don't evaluate where we're at, we can't grow. We just can't grow. Okay. Now we're going to do number one together, but this is still giving everyone at a table and Zoom a time to pick number two through 10. And Zoom gets the first pick. So you have to send a chat to me on which number you're picking in the next two to three minutes. Okay, Zoom. So here we go. Let's do number one together so you get how this works. And then you're going to be set loose at your table to do your own uh, means of grace. All right. So now Grudem, number one, he says teaching of the word of God. And, and I'm a little bit mystified by that. I would put quotation marks around the words teaching of the. The means of grace is the word. It's the word. Okay. I don't know why he put teaching of the, because when you read the word of God tonight or tomorrow morning, as you're opening, I mean, you're not, you may be teaching yourself, but that's not what we typically say. You're reading it to draw closer to Jesus. So it's the word of God, which is the means. What is my part in uh, doing in receiving this means? What is my part? I'm looking for the active verbs that you do in order to receive the word. I read it. There's your first action. I read it. What else do I do to get this means of grace into my life? What else? Share it. I share it. So I'll, I'll share a verse with somebody. I'll text it. I'll talk on the phone with my neighbor. Okay. I'll explain it. What else? How else do I get this means of grace in my life? I, I, I think about it. I want to process. What did, what did I just read? Great. Did I hear a second person? Okay, God, what does this mean to me? I just read this, asking you, oh, see, seeking your knock. What does this mean for me? What else did I hear? Okay, yeah, think about this a little bit. Don't just read and pull the handle and expect God to throw a yummy at you, <laughs> right? What does this mean? Think about it a little bit. What is each word? Struggling, laboring, working out. See, I try to illustrate what we all ought to do. What does each one of those words mean to me? And how do I do what it says? So my part in receiving the word as a means of grace, to hear it, to read it. Did anybody want to dare to say, memorize it? Yep. Folks, that's a hard one for us. I, I'm going to say in this class, we haven't gained a whole lot of ground in it, brothers and sisters. But you know what? Yeah, see, we're expecting fast food Christianity. I just want more of Jesus because I came to Robert's Wednesday night class. It don't work that way, does it? So um, it's memorizing it, studying it, discussing it. Okay, uh, John 5, 39 is not in your notes. I added it late. Jesus said, you diligently study the scriptures. He said that to the religious leaders. The religious leaders were great Bible studiers, better than us, better than me. You diligently study the scriptures, verse 40, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Folks, you can read Holy Scripture all day long and never draw closer to Jesus. Oh, may that not be true of us. May that not be true of us, right? Jesus said it. Be careful. The word is not just ink on paper. It's a person. It is the living God. That's who you're meeting with when you open the covers, right? Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Be, uh, so everyone must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who, anybody know the end of the verse? He rewards those who 
earnestly seek him. Seek him. Earnestly. How's your earnestness in searching the person of Jesus in the Holy Word? How earnest are you? Well, here we are. I'm reading in Leviticus today, and oh boy, this is a doozy of a passage. Jesus, I may not get all of this, but I want to see you and find you in these few verses I I read today. See, it's got to be the person of Jesus that you're earnestly seeking and you believe he's going to show himself to you. See, without faith, it's impossible. Uh, You know, you can read the book all day long. If you have no faith that Christ is in the book, what are we going to get out of it? Okay, so that's critical. Now, what blessings come to me? right? Uh, in, in receiving the word of God. This is question number two. What blessings come to me? Let you all say a few of them out loud because this should be easy. I hope. Wisdom. Wisdom. God gives me how to think and what to choose next. He gives me peace when I'm troubled or have anxiety. That's real. What else happens? Uh, yeah. Oh, encouragement, right? I'm, I'm depressed. I'm down. And God brings encouragement when I read Holy Scripture. Now, hope. Yeah. What other blessings come? Strength. Thank you. Joy. I need a blessing from over here, this table. What blessing comes when you when you use the means of the word of God? Joy. I heard joy. Okay. That, that you understand more something about your world and your circumstance. Okay. Peace. Did we have that one over here? That's a double blessing yeah, that's a double blessing, right? Um, so, so yeah, tons of things. The word of God is a sword which penetrates. It can convict. It can tell you when you're wrong, right? Yeah, so lots of things there, the blessings, right? Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey. honey. The psalmist says, your word, boy, Brothers, do you have that experience when you're done reading your couple of verses? That's what meeting with Jesus is about. Oh, sweeter than honey. Whoa. I don't need a call verse tonight. I just need a couple of verses of Jesus. See? Okay. So um, right now, uh, this is a real quickie. Turn to any particular scripture passage. Any. Any. Get ready. And I'm going to ask you to read it. Turn to any passage, any passage, and you're going to read it. This is called a scripture shower. You are going to shower one another with a biblical passage. Now, truthfully, somebody will say at the end of this little test, Robert, I didn't get a sweeterness out of this. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, we certainly develop in an agonizing way. Sometimes we develop our skills in, in reading and loving scripture. Have you got one for us? Get says, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Okay, there was Isaiah 34 uh, mentioned there. Thanks. Who's got another verse? Just give give me any verse. Go ahead. George? Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. <laughs> That's a blessing. He works. He works, folks. Who had the next one, John? Second Peter 1 3. Divine power has given you everything for godliness. Everything. That's oh, oh that's sweet. I I, I owe oh, me of little faith. Oh me. Of let, uh, whose hand did I see in this direction? Okay, go ahead. Uh, Job 1.8. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Wow. There's an example, Job 1.8. Um, yeah, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And it's like, God, I want to be that kind of man who fears you rightly with every thought and decision and shuns evil. I want to turn away from it, God. Help me, Jesus, to be like that. I saw a hand here. Galatians 5, 22, 23. Um, the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, 
as help could help. Excellent. And and our scripture shower person had that uh, really well memorized. So, you know, it's something in your mind, or your heart, you can share with someone else if you don't have a book or phone with you. So, folks, that's the point. Scripture shower. All scripture is God breathed and profitable for us. It's a blessing. Get more of it. None of us have enough of it uh, every given day. But that's an example of a scripture shower. OK, now, question number three, if I'm not blessed by God's word, why may, why would I not be blessed? Uh, what's the answer to, if I walk out of church, I walk out of Bible study that I'm not blessed. I, it's possible. I am not a believer folks test yourselves and see if you're in the faith. The Bible says that. So just cause you walked into church, you know, does that mean you're a believer? So that may be a reason you're not receiving blessing from the word of God. Okay. What other reasons might there be? If I'm not blessed, why not? That's question number three. Okay, distracted. Yep. Another one would say distract. I'm distracted. I'm having a hard time keeping my fine focus. What are the reasons? You know what? Maybe I haven't. Yeah, looked in the mirror, or things in the past. I'm not. I haven't dealt with things in my past. Right. Uh, that could be variable, and so thus, you know, the the blessing of God, you know, gets to be then uh, negated. Right. Uh, friends, if there's unconfessed sin in our lives, and and perhaps we we just have to ask the Holy Spirit, what does this verse mean? <laughs> what does this mean? And what does it mean for me? Okay. So then, number four, you would do yourself. What is my progress with the Word of God as a means of grace? What is my progress? So right now, you'll make a hash mark on that arrow, which is a continuum between one and four. Right now, if you put number four and you come up to me later, you're 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 leading the Bible study next week, by the way. <laughs> OK, yeah, because I'd love that to happen for all of us to break into groups and do that. Right. But that's for your purpose. Where are you at with this means of grace? And uh, and so now, you know, as best as you understand, you know, I'm a one point seven. I'm a, I'm a two point eight you know, on this. And, and now I know, OK, there, there's some work I can do. I can I can roll up my sleeves and make a new plan to receive more of this. Because you know what, <laughs> folks, sit, letting it sit there doesn't help you any. There's no osmosis in having a big Catholic Bible on your coffee table, right? That looks pretty for your family and your friends. No, nope, no blessing at all. None. It's when you use the word of God and bring it to you. Now, um, Zoom, folks, you've sent me then your selection uh, of we? which one you're doing. Um, so the bottom one says prayer, anyone. So that's what zoom is going to do. Uh, zoom is going to do uh, prayer, which is number four. So that's been selected now for our folks that are in the live class. Who's got their pick. Tell me which one first hand gets the first pick. Okay. First hand gets the first pick. Okay. So over here, worship has just been selected, which is number Number five has now been taken. Who's next? You're picking one of them, folks. I'll let you know if it's already been picked. Okay, the back table took number number nine has now been taken. We've got two tables left. Giving uh, is number seven has been taken. And the last table to my left. Number nine has been taken. Uh, number 11, we'll do it together. Number two, baptism. That's it. You got it. Okay, folks, I'm going to give you a, about nine minutes or so. Uh, talk at your table. You're answering the three primary questions together at your table. Question number one. What is my part in this means of grace that our table picked? What's my part? What do I do in this? How do I, I roll up my sleeves and get involved in this means of grace? Number two, what blessings come to me in this means of grace? Number three, if I'm not blessed in this means of grace, why not? So you're recording your answers for those three questions, and then you'll report them live to all of us. Okay. So talk, uh, zoom, you're talking out loud together, gathering your answers and you'll have to send the answers to me via chat. Okay. And then, um, we'll, we will go sequentially. So no, we'll start with number two, 
Then number four, five, seven, and nine. So um, Zoomers, you're in the middle of the pack. You get a little bit of time to send the chats, okay? So enjoy your time together. Um, and you may use your text, but the text doesn't always help you with all the answers to the three questions, okay? You can use Grudem's text or any passages I've given you, but enjoy talking together. Okie doke. Mute yourself so we can discuss this. Oh, it says laboring in prayer. Well, I think the first thing we have to do to be part of it is to do it. You know, we have to pray. There's a lot of us that don't, you know, so. And also learn how to do it. Is somebody going to be a typer? I can't reach my keyboard. <laughs> why, why not? It's too far. Away. I'm too short. That's why. Okay. <laughs> so somebody tall has to type. Jim, <laughs> would you like to type? Jim? No, I'm not a. I'm not a good one for this. I, I don't type, I hunt and peck. I think we should start praying now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any others for number one? Do it, learn how to do it, what else? Are you going to do it, Sharon? Hi, Sharon. You're better off using your head. Click on chat here. Are, are you doing it, Sharon? Click on chat, and you'll lose this. And that's where it is. Well, just click anywhere up in here. I can do it. Learn how to pray. So that when you start typing, it'll be down here. Yeah, Sharon, yeah. we're doing number one first. Um, to type the message? Yeah. Wherever it says that, I can't, I can't do it. So. Yes, that's where you are. This sounds like a family reunion. Okay, so I we had learn and then you can learn how to pray. What are you kind of thinking there? Um, we're just gonna list them things we can do. Okay, go go for it. Does anybody have any others? I think the thing with learning how to pray, people are really hesitant to pray out loud. Because a lot of us brought up in churches that we should like pray the Lord's prayer or creed. Yep. You know, we didn't specifically pray out loud for somebody. Right. <laughs> Can can we get Robert to mute him? He wouldn't know how to do it. It would totally confuse him. So um, when we talked about learn how to pray, I'm kind of thinking about how scripture, um, you know, there's different people. Well, even this verse that's given here, how they prayed for um, maturity and, and that kind of thing. That's kind of how I'm thinking about learning how to pray. Or did you have something else in mind? Well, Jesus talked about it, didn't he? Yeah. How others yeah, prayed. So that was him, too. The Lord's Prayer would be one. But read, read, the, read the question. Oh, somebody mentioned what, how, what uh, how to learn how to pray. Four minutes, to... folks. Four minutes, and we're okay, going to wrap we gotta up. Go. So you should be at Let's least in the second question. Okay. Four minutes. <laughs> oh, God's blessing. Prayer. What blessings come to me when we pray? Um, answer to prayer. Yeah. Also, peace and uh, contentment and uh, uh, healing of relationships. 
And feeling of what? Well, the a blessing that a comes to me. The blessing that comes to me is, you know, to, to know how humble you are if you are talking to God. You know, to be in this blessing. Just to know that God is listening to what you say. <laughs> What was that? Okay. So I put down learn how to pray, pray, uh, I'm sorry, answer to prayer, feeling of relationship, knowing God wants us to pray for him and for each other. You want any more? That's good. What was the last thing you said, Kathy? It's a blessing um, to know. Knowing God wants us to pray to him and for each other. Okay, so let's go to three then. If I'm not blessed, why? Well, Psalm 66 18 is that you have perhaps sin in your life. And and uh, James 4 2 is uh, asking with wrong motives. I'm sorry, what was that? Ask what? And James 4 2 talks about asking with the wrong motives. Anything else? John 5 14 uh, talks about sit in your life again. Maybe unrepentance. Oh, yeah. So the, the, the first the Psalm and John both talk about, about sin in your life, and then James talks about one minute, folks, one minute to wrap up, and then we'll share. One minute. There's no way to go back and edit. That's really, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to add um, Randy's um, references, but I. Oh, they're they're in there. They're actually in the question. Oh, okay, okay. The, the question is giving us a hint on, on what, oh, why okay. we're going to be getting blessing. All right, thank you. How how is my progress? Yeah. That's the Anything else, you guys? I don't know how we're supposed to answer the last fourth question as a group. Oh, that's a personal that's thing. A personal, yeah. Right, right. Yes. Okay, friends, I don't think we're ready. I hope you had a good time chatting about your uh, particular means of grace, right? Just one that you could wrap your heads around and talk about with your, your friends at your group. And, and thanks very much to our Zoomers. I'm seeing your chats, so that'll help. And, uh, and, and hopefully you folks feel as engaged as with the uh, rest of the people that are here in the live class. Okay, so we'll do these sequentially. Uh, which table pick number two, baptism? Which table pick number two? Okay. So uh, the table, yeah, to my left right here is pick baptism. So you're going to walk us through each of the questions. So what's my part in receiving this means of grace? What's my part, folks? So you're going to help answer, and I'll repeat, of course, so our Zoomers are engaged too. Okay. Yeah, to, a desire to be closer to God. What? What? Can you be more specific? What is my part in receiving the blessing, though, of the, this means of grace, baptism? Thanks. Yeah, it, it almost begs the obvious, doesn't it, Barb? So, folks, brothers and sisters, if 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 any one of you, I, I 
I, I've run across this in our church frequently. I'm not sure why. It could be, you know, because of our own failure to teach right. If you are saved, any one of you, dear brothers and sisters, and you are not water baptized, you are forfeiting the grace and blessing of God. Please, I, I've found people who said I've been saved for 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years. Oh, when were you baptized? I never have been. What about the baptism as an infant? Well, well that, that begs a question of a different doctrinal subject. What about a baptism as an infant, right? So you will have to go to the discussion of did Holy Scripture command infants to be baptized? And that's where we're going to have a little struggle with that, okay? So I grew up as, you know, uh, infant baptized as well, too, and, and, you know, came here and got illumined and shed some light on that particular subject for me. So uh, th 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 this is important. I mean, see, this is as practical as Christian living gets. Jesus has commanded it. If we haven't done it, you've just cut yourself off from grace and blessing of Jesus. It's as simple as that, folks. So please, if you want to talk personally and privately, maybe there's something that has kept you from being water baptized and identifying with Jesus. Let me know, because by the way, when I, you know, wandered through Baptist churches and charismatic churches and whatever, they wanted me to jump through everybody's hoop on this issue. And it's like, I'm not going to jump through anybody's hoop on this. You know, I'm going to do what Jesus wants me to do. Um, but this is a key blessing. If, if you are not water baptized, please, that you, you, you've just cut yourself off from, as from adult. blessing as, as yes, because, because infant or baby baptism is not the doctrine we hold to or adhere to that we believe scripture teaches because a child can't identify with Christ in any way of understanding sin or confessing it, which is, which is primer to being baptized that you've understood you're a sinner and that you've confessed uh, sin to God and asked for forgiveness. That That's a necessity in Holy Scripture before water baptism, not that your parents brought you to a, a baptismal font, okay? Number two, what's God's blessing in baptism? What's his blessing? What grace does he bring to this one-time event? Table number one. Right. The, the more of the Holy Spirit's work in me, right? It just feels so much closer. Yes, a closeness, a literal closeness to Jesus, right? When I was baptized, you know, in water, it felt like so many things were lifted. Okay, lift things. So we had a testimony that things felt lifted when I was baptized, right? So, so the presence of Christ, the awareness of the Holy Spirit, a stronger faith. Uh, you're identifying with Jesus, which means you're also publicly uh, speaking of him. You're saying, yeah, Christ is in me. I'm one of his, right? You're identifying yourself that way. So connection with other believers who are baptized, because that's how God's family is identified. The, why, why do people come and watch baptisms? Because we are a family that are connected together. And now, a, a, yes, a celebration. And that is a grace and a blessing, of course, in the one time event. That's why we never want to go through another summer where we don't have water baptisms every July, August, and September, because that's sad. We, we don't experience that blessing of grace with the person being baptized, you know? So there's no uh, COVID in the water. Come on out. Let, let's be baptized. Okay. All right. Um, number three, number three, if you're not blessed, why not? Did you answer that question table table? For the wrong reasons. Okay, you might be, yeah, because it's a church function or it's a church ceremony, for the wrong reasons you're being baptized, okay? Any other answers? You, um, I guess it, the experience is just a wonderful thing in itself. Yes. And uh, it, it brings a calmness and a peace to my heart. Right. It made me focus a little more on God. Yeah. So if, if you if you're not receiving this, yeah, what's the reason you may not be? Number one, you're not saved. You're not saved. <laughs> That'd be a reason why you wouldn't receive the grace of a baptism in a church ceremony, because you number one, you're just not saved. Right? Mm -hmm. What other other reasons if you if you're hiding sin in your life. <laughs> 
you're hiding sin because this is a public declaration that Christ has forgiven my sin. So if you're hiding sin, you're forfeiting, you know, grace and blessing at the point. So there's lots of factors that come into play, right? Uh, maybe, maybe you're fearful or ashamed of the gospel. Maybe you don't want to publicly identify with Jesus. That'd be a reason that you wouldn't receive grace or blessing from it, right? You don't want people to know you're a Christian. Maybe you weren't fully immersed. Or, or, or deep enough, John? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's go to number four, which is our Zoom friends, correct? Our Zoom friends uh, picked a prayer or I assigned it to them, whichever way it worked. And they did a great job in answering the question. So what's my part in receiving the, the means of grace of prayer? Well, their answer is, folks, pray. Just do it. See, we, we can know the answer is correct, that we should pray and commune with Jesus. We should talk with him, but then we never do it. You don't get grace because you know the correct answer. The grace comes because you communicate with Jesus, your brother. So the, the Zoom did a great job uh, with that one. Thanks for that. Okay. So, and then God's blessing. How does God's blessing come to us? They said, um, well, of course, learning how to pray, how to pray, note in scripture how others prayed, including Jesus, and then follow that. The blessings they listed here now are answers to prayer. <laughs> Right? It's, is that a great no-brainer? That's how grace comes to your life. When you communicate with the living God, you intentionally communicate with him, right? So answers come, peace, uh, a feeling of a relationship with Christ. Um, and, and it's powerful to know God's listening to you who are his child. So they, they answered all that as blessings. Blessings to know God wants us to pray uh, and for each other, they listed that. And if you're not blessed, why not? They said possibly sin is in your life. You're hiding sin. You're not dealing with it. Uh, or you're asking with wrong motives. You're asking with wrong motives. Boy, I sure like that new electric Tesla. Because then I don't have to wait till 2035 when all our, our General Motors cars will no longer be uh, internal combustion. <laughs> Did you get that one this week? It's like, whoa, that's too close in my future. It's like, I still like, well, sorry, I'll get somebody mad on, on uh, listening to this. I still like my internal combustion engine. But thanks for that. If, if you're praying with a wrong motive, you know, and not praying, of course, the will of God. So, friends, I, I, I neglected, you know, on the first one. But right now, everybody, it's your chance to make your mark on your arrow, your continuum. Where are you at Right with this, what is your personal progress with prayer? What is it? Is it an active part of your life? So now everybody should do this, not just the table that answered it. Please mark for yourself. Uh, it, in my discipline of employing prayer to connect with the living God and receive his blessing, I feel I'm at a two. I feel I'm at a three. This is your chance. I, I can't ask you more than enough. Please do this exercise, though, for yourself. Don't just think about what I'm saying. Please mark it, because otherwise you won't know how to grow. You won't know how to grow. Does that make sense? Has everybody made their mark? Have all the Zoomers made their mark? Thanks. Good. I see a couple of heads shaking there. So, so hopefully you've marked. And especially with the baptism one, if you are not personally baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ, please uh, mark yourself then as a one and let's talk. If you're not baptized, it's a one. It's it's nothing more than that. It can't be, okay? And with prayer, of course, it might be different. One, two, three, you know, up to four, all right? Who picked number five? Worship. I think that's our table to my right. Picked the means of grace of worship. Help us out. What is my part in this means of grace of worship? Help us out, table to my right. Here we go. Thanksgiving, songs of worship and praise, group worship. Okay. To be fully engaged. To be fully engaged. Offering, singing, offering praise. Uh, you know, songs of Thanksgiving. Yes, reading the Word. So not always just singing. It's it's both. What other things? What's my part in receiving this? Folks, thanks, folks. Some of these means of grace aren't they? They're just so obvious, and yet this is where we might fail. Show up. Show up. You're not going to receive the grace of God of meeting with him in worship unless you show up. Yeah. Any others on my part? What is my part with worship? 
Did we catch most of them there? Okay, excellent, right? I heard some singing over here. So, yep, we, we just designated some new worship leaders at table number five to my right here. But uh, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Folks, give thanks. Give thanks. I don't care if you're off key. Give thanks. Sing. Let something come out of your mouth, right? Give to God. This is He loves uh, to hear you uh, worship him. And I heard a comment from another table, please. Another important one that we often talk about is to come prepared to worship. Excellent comment. Come prepared to worship. Yeah, folks, maybe we're, yeah, see, and I'm a fear, thank, for, thank you for mentioning that. Maybe the problem, see, that comes, if I'm not blessed, why not? That would come under there. Because if I'm not coming prepared, there is a preparation process. There is. In the olden days, which isn't all that old ago, my grandfather ministered in a church in Montello. There you go. You can look up the records. When you wanted to come to communion just you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, do you know what the parishioners did? They came personally to my grandfather's uh, parsonage and to his office to speak personally with him about communion. You came personally to the minister so that you could intentionally prepare and engage and, and now here, here, here's what I'm afraid of. And actually, I mean, I, I'm still fearful of it. I distribute our little prepared cups and wafers at the Welcome Center. And what preparation is there that any, they just grab the thing and go? You know what? I mean, I'm not the clearinghouse. Neither is the pastor, you know, per se. But that's how engaged parts of worship used to be. You met with the pastor. Maybe you prayed. Maybe you asked him to pray for you because of sin you're struggling with. It was far more engaging than our hands off, you know, grab the tray or grab your little thing at the welcome center and, and peel off the stickers. So thank you for that. Yeah. Now t- our, our table here though still is going to answer what blessing comes to me as I worship. What is the, the blessing of God that comes to me? Did we answer that? No. Hearing Hearing it, drawing closer to God. Folks, this is a reality. In worship, God particularly meets. Yeah, can can you worship God in your deer stand and in your fishing boat? Yes, but he said, I want you to gather together. There's a power that God dispenses and gives when we gather. So drawing near to God, this is a promised grace. You're closer to him. Please, what else? Get rid of worldliness. Okay, yep. It's it's in worship. It's time for me to shed some worldly thinking or worldly action saying, God, I need a break from this in my life. I, a parting. I need to part from it, right? Thank you. Any others? The blessing that God brings in worship. I don't know, but I can sing at home all day long, and I don't have tears in my eyes. But I do at church. Yes. And yes. I think the Holy Spirit it is more active when yes. you're in church singing with a body that, you know, a body of believers. Yes. It's more powerful. The common is the Hebrews 10 25 verse, you know, where, where scripture says, don't forsake getting together. There is the promise when two or three are gathered together, there am I in your midst. There is the promise of a closerness to the living God when you choose to come wherever believers are gathered. So if it's in your house church someday, because this one, you know, will be torn down or taken you know, by the government, that's okay. But there is. So the comment was, I mean, I, I love singing while I'm mowing grass because I'm trying to drown out the, the, the pitch of the lawnmower, I think. But I love doing that. But the comment was that the worshiper here at this table says that the weeping before God can happen here where it doesn't happen when I'm mowing grass. Now, sometimes when I sing Rock of Ages, man, I mean, don't look at me because I'm watering the lawn. When God and I commune and I'm mowing, it's watering the lawn, baby, because it does. But the comment of there is a different power and a different presence of God because he said, I want you to meet with me right? I watch it in the old Testament. It was a tent and then the temple, right? Now we are the temples of the living God, but thanks for that comment. What about if I'm not blessed in worship? Why not? What were some of your answers? I think it's a tax of Satan. 
attacks of Satan. Yeah, I'll answer these. Go ahead. If you come in with a problemed relationship into worship, and, and you know what? Yeah, I love that one because you maybe looked up Matthew 5. Boy, if, if there's something between you and another brother or sister, the, the, the text says, folks, hightail it out of church. God doesn't want you in there as a fake Go and reconcile. I appreciate that. That's why your worship is flat, because maybe there's a conflict that you haven't resolved with another brother or sister. Don't come in and, oh, God, I love you. Ah. See? And God says, why aren't you doing what I've already called you to do? I've called you to confess sins to one another and ask for forgiveness that you might be healed. Thanks for that. Folks, please make a mark on your continuum right now. Um, what's my progress in worship? What is my progress? Are you a one, two, three, four, or anything in between? Make your tiny mark, make your line. This is for you. But if we don't evaluate, we can't grow. If we don't personally evaluate. Okay. Is that good? All right. Now we're going to number seven and we have number seven and number nine to do yet. And then hopefully a little bit of 11. Who, who picked number seven as the means of grace? Excellent. The table right in front of me. Um, did you want to see those folks by chance tonight? <laughs> no, you didn't? <laughs> yeah, you want to, you know, I mean, just, there are people here. Zoom, Zoomers? Yeah, there are people here. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to make you dizzy on Zoom either. If I turn this too fast, you all get nauseous like on a boat. Okay, go ahead. Now, our, we've this table in front of us has picked giving as a means of Folks, is this a little contradictory? You give, but grace and more of Jesus comes to you as you give. It almost seems contradictory. Our friends here are going to tell us, what is my part in this means of grace? Here we go. Our part is to give back to God all he blesses us with. Okay. I don't only, we don't only need money. We talk yeah. about the fact of the homes that we live in, the miles that are left on our car that we can drive. All sorts of things that yes. he provides for us. Time. Time. He's given me a retirement life. Yep. If you're retired, giving of your retirement life. So the comet was very wonderful, uh, overarching comet. It, my part is to give uh, appropriately and proportionately back to God, no matter what stage of life you're in right now, working or not working. What is? What are you going to trust God with? Folks, that's the bottom line. What do you, and is God trustworthy enough? So any, and yet that's your part, right? It is to give folks, boy. Um, and you know, the biblical record, uh, you know, it sets people off and this is where all of a sudden the blessing will be forfeited. Are, are you checking yourself? The biblical minimum of giving in, in uh, old and new Testament is what? 10%. It is folks. That's biblical 10%. Uh, are you doing that as a base, you know, as your baseline, as your minimum? Uh, and and uh, yeah, then then it's got to be cheerfully. Yeah, see the Zoom folks connected with that as well too. See, so God even gave standards for us to start with. That's not a that's not an ending point either. A tithe is never an ending point because, as ta this table said, it with what God has entrusted to you. So you know what I mean. Honestly, Bill Gates tithing that that's a, a slap. That's a slap. That guy is a bazillion air and he gives 10%. I, I don't know if he does or doesn't, I, you know, but you see it's in proportion to what you're receiving. It's in, in proportion. So, th so then, yeah, I mean, he doesn't, yeah. Or Rupert Murdoch or who else is out there? I, I just heard there were new billionaires on the list this week. I heard it. Uh, some gals were out there too. Woo -hoo! Women power. There are billionaires in the world. Okay. What did we miss now? Let's go to God's blessing. What is the blessing? It, I, I, I've just given money or time or resources away. I've served. What's the blessing then? How, how is giving a conduit for, for God's presence? Anybody on middle table? Well, one of the things that we said is that we always seem to give back more than we give. That God blesses us by multiplying many <laughs> things to us. Cool. The answer was God multiplies often what I give and it comes back. Right? So we typically think of giving as a depletion 
of resource, no matter if it's money, cash, time, or whatever, a depletion. And this table said the blessing, though, is that God, in often amazing ways, brings back to you more than you gave away. (laughs) Go figure. So what about if I'm not blessed as a believer in giving? Why not? What would be some possible reasons? Well, one of the things that we said is often you're not giving to glorify God, but you're doing it for your own human. Okay. Satisfy your own mind or heart. Yeah, I'm giving because the church says I should give. It, it, it's not out of devotion or adoration to God. That would be a reason you're not being blessed. Okay. You know, kind of thing. Hey, look at me. Look what I do. Or it could be the ego thing, right? And uh, you got the adoration of praise of a couple of people that saw you, you know, put in or give or whatever you gave. But that runs out pretty quick then, doesn't it? It's like the rich guy that gives five dollars. Yeah. And everybody thinks, oh, that poor, you know, what a wonderful man gave that five dollars. But they don't know about the billions he's got hidden under his bed. Oh, let's go to the mattress. Huh? <laughs> OK. But gaining trust, the more you, you trust God with your finances mm-hmm. and then you find out that, you know, like you start with the. Eight percent, and they're giving fifteen percent, giving twenty. Yeah, and he's still providing abundantly. Right, right. So it, it it may be. Do you have a trust issue with God? Do 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 you trust him that that if you actually gave something sacrificially and it looks like you wouldn't be able to pay the bills at the end of the month? Can you trust him to provide? So I, I appreciate that thing. You may not be. Being blessed in your giving. See, slot machine God. It's like, come on, God, I just put in put in my whatever. Be, because there's a trust factor and you're you're hiding you know, that, you know, I really don't know if this works or not. Can God be trusted? Can God be trusted? Okay. So uh, thanks for that. Anything else? Our middle table. Did, did, did that help um, in, on any of the three? Great. Friends, it's your time. Please make a mark on your arrow. Under number seven in giving. How are you doing? This is your own evaluation. How are you doing with giving? You know, I I trust right now, too, for all of us here, right, that that if, if this is really real, the Holy Spirit ought to be doing a little bit of speaking or convicting to any one of us that may think we're in the right place and we're not. See, that's really how this works, right? That's really how this works. So uh, please be affirmed if you're sensing even a conviction like, you know what, I'm really not in the spot I should be with giving. Please be affirmed. The spirit is drawing closer to you. You are drawing closer to the spirit. You're actually hearing the Holy Spirit, you know, it help you evaluate your giving and, and you don't know the answer yet. That's why you're going to go home and 10 minutes and, and keep asking God, what is my answer on giving? What, what should I do next? How should I trust you with giving next? You see, do you get the point? But if you're hearing something from the spirit of God, that's great. That's great. Right. Cause that's the whole point of receiving more of Jesus, receiving more of his grace. Number nine, number nine is our back table. Is that correct? Okay. Number nine is fellowship. They, Oh, this is loaded. Don't, uh, number the, the means of fellowship to receive more of Jesus. Don't sell this one short, friends. Um, so here we go. We're going to start. What is my part in, um, in, in, in participating in this means of grace fellowship? What's my part? Um, to gather together. Gather together. Become a part of a unit. B- to become part of a unit. A large unit or and okay, yeah, whether the whole church or a part of the church, okay. see, Excellent. or a small group. To step, step out of your comfort zone. To step out of your comfort zone, fellowship. I'm, wait a minute, this one, I love this one. But I'm introverted. I can't do fellowship. What, 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 can you help me with that one? Because that may be the, if you're not blessed, why not? Yeah. Oh. Sorry, God made me introverted. I don't have to fellowship. Did I get out of this one? Uh, Table number nine? No, no, I did. Okay, sorry. Yeah, keep going. Um, Also, to share when you're fellowshipping, you're called. Our part is to share with others. To share with others is what they're saying. 
struggles and, positive. and and positive blessings. Share. Yes, share. What's God doing? And Excellent. That comes being open and being honest. Being open being and honest. A group of people and get to know each other at an intimate level. You're not honest and you're not open. Yeah. Um, where do you struggle? Yeah. And where do you help? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, folks, That this is powerful, isn't it? Transparency. How, how transparent are you with some other believers, right? <laughs> with some. Uh, that's powerful. I appreciate that. Do you, does anybody know offhand, Google this for me, how many one another passages are in the New Testament? Does anybody know that off the top of their head? How many? Do, do you know what I mean? The script New Testament is filled with the one another, love one another and so forth, right? Uh, be devoted to one another. Th th those are all the fellowship things, folks. We we cannot not do that. And and thus, my prayer tonight in particular for my dear Zoom friends, literally, folks, we love that you're on. Unfortunately, I, I am getting hard, worse with the system of Zoom because I can't engage with you enough. I, I just confess that. It's not working for me. But for you, dear folks, you, you have to work uh, perhaps a little bit harder because you're in your little box on Zoom on my screen. You have to work harder for this blessing and this grace, right? Just showing up on Zoom may or may not bring the grace or closeness of Jesus. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying you have to break and get out of your house, but don't, don't let this one get off easy either, right? Because it, it's hard on Zoom. We're in our little compartment here. And, um, and we, oh, now this is blinking. Does that, is that bad news that this is blinking? That means stop the study. Okay. Thanks friends. Um, what's God's blessing table, table nine, what's God's blessing in this means of grace. When I mix and connect with believers, what's God's blessing? The support of other Christians. Support of other Christians. Yep. Um, an accountability partners. Accountability partners. Encouragement. Encouragement. Thank you. Um, someone to walk with during difficult times. Someone to walk with in difficult times. Um, Those are someone good. Who helps you lighten your load. Yep. Somebody, somebody who will carry a burden for you that you yourself have and can't carry anymore. Yep. Um, guidance. Guidance. And also peace. Peace. That's huge. Affirmation. affirmation. Yeah, being part of the body. That, that's huge, isn't it? That Who doesn't want more of Jesus in all these areas, right? But I'm introverted. I, you know what? Then just keep seeking, friend, for whoever that may be, because I, I think there's tons of people, introverted people can connect with. I think there are. Even if you have to find another introverted person. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I am too. So, <laughs> psychologically, it's like, this is scary. Yeah, sitting up in front of all you dear folks. It's like, oh, scares the bejeebers. I still yeah. know that personally, I need some people that I can gather with. Yeah. There are folks. For anybody who has, you know, you know, even social folks with social disorders or any other things like that, I'm not undermining that. But you know what? God's got some people for you to connect. He does. But this is where receiving his grace means struggling, agonizing, and not quitting. Don't expect God to be a slot machine. Work harder to find who that, that group or one or two people are then. If that's, if that's how you're wired right now, you know, where it's just super hard for you to like people. Ugh. Right? <laughs> Some people, <"Ugh." laughs> like people? Yeah, because this is where God brings grace. Okay. Well, um, what, what I, what I like particularly about number 11 and we won't do much on Crudum really did a great job and gave three pages or so to number 11. I'm on page 959 of the text. If that helps you. And then we're going to wrap up and close 959. I, I hope this little small group thing was, was great and engaging. I hope the little you've marked your, your fellow. Did you make your fellowship mark then? 
to, did you make your mark so that, you know, is there growth for you in fellowship? Please, there's a comment yet from the fellowship table. They want a fellowship with us. Go ahead. The fellowship, I just wanted to add, it's, there's also fellowship with Jesus Christ and suffering that he endured. We are mm. to uh, fellowship with him as he suffered to feel yeah. he suffered. That sounds like a lot like Romans 8. To fellowship with Christ in his sufferings is the comment that the table was making yet. Sounds like Romans 8. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit, Spirit, right? So, yeah, the persons of God, the invisible persons of God, fellowship with them. Excellent. Thank you. Personal ministry to individuals. Grudem did a neat job by highlighting several things. First of all, words of encouragement or exhortation. A word, a psalm, uh, Proverb 25, 11, a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Folks, the power of your words, they can tear down someone in an instant. Or they can powerfully lift someone from the pits of hell. A simple word of encouragement. Grudem used this as a means of grace, the power of words. That, I love that he did that. Um, but be careful, Proverbs 26, 28, a flattering tongue works ruin. Be careful with your words. I mean, it, there's got to be sincerity in it when you give somebody a, a compliment or, you know, a blessing. Don't make it fake. Don't flatter people and it's false, right? Flattering tongue. Because that, that doesn't bring blessing to that person or you. It just builds their head up, right? Grudem dealt with that. He dealt with anointing with oil. Folks, did you read that section? Are we missing a blessing from God because at large we don't do this work of grace? Please think about this carefully because we're we're at the end. But you know what? I think he rightly brought up things I haven't considered. Blessing that I'm forfeiting because I'm not doing what scripture bids me to do in faith. The oil, he says, the oil doesn't have miraculous power. It isn't, you know, I mean, great. It'll make your skin smoother or something like that. That's not it. But it's because of, yes, the anointing of the Holy Spirit and such. But then after that, the last section was laying on of hands. And this one to me was, he he gave uh, about eight different or nine, 10 different ways, page 959 and following, where he talked about scripture giving the example of laying hands on people for different purposes, for physical touch, for healing, for blessing children, for miracles, for equipping people for service for receiving the Holy Spirit for the first time or second time. Uh, Spiritual gifts were imparted by laying on of hands. Leaders were commissioned by laying on of hands. Folks, uh, we are in a scary society where physical touch has been used to ruin people. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? But has the body of Christ also thus forfeited closeness with Jesus because we don't, maybe even at this point of your arm, you know, yeah, you, we have to be totally careful. And men who have physical contact with women or women with men, and it's not your spouse or your child. Yes, we have to, but this biblical example, are we missing some grace because we don't even gently come to somebody and says, you know what, I'm going to put my hand on you and I'm going to pray for you. I'm just going to do that right here. I'm going to put it on your hand or on your wrist where nothing will be confused as being, you know, inappropriate or whatever. But that section grew him. I thought he just, woof, physical touch. Jesus did it. He was the example. So let's do it right. Let's do it appropriately. When you come to somebody on Sunday, I mean, the Holy Spirit of God, maybe you do. You say, boy, I'm so glad to see you. And you just go up and put your hand on that person's hand. Okay, I get the COVID thing. I, I get the whole hand washing thing. I get the, you know, I get that. So when it's the right time, you know, let God guide you. But there, there's a means of grace. Jesus held little children and he blessed them just by holding them, right? 
So you know how that works with your children and grandchildren, but I love that section. The foot washing thing, I'll let you work on that one, number 12, foot washing. I agree, it's not an ordinance that the church is mandated to repeat, as foot washing does not in and of itself point to the cross the way baptism and the Lord's Supper does. Those ordinances point to redemption. Foot washing in and of itself doesn't point to that. It points to your cuticles and dirty feet. And what, what's the other? Yeah, don't, well, let's not go there. So it's, it's not, not, I agree with Grudem. There are ceremonies where you might have participated in foot washing and been incredibly blessed. Don't undermine that. But I wouldn't ever elevate it to the third Sunday of the month at WCC. We're going to all have foot washing. You see, I mean, okay, a comment or question on that? I was going to say, I observed it in a wedding ceremony. In a wedding? And I found it very moving, and it actually brought me to tears. That okay. A couple washed each other's feet, and that, that really the, got me. The comment was in a wedding ceremony that the bride and groom washed each other's feet as a picture or sign of humility. And that was moving and it, it led to tears for a minute. I, I would think so too. A mutual submission to each other. See, then the power of the ceremony, you know, makes sense in its given setting. Okay. You. Folks, did you, did you mark your, your sheets? Oh, please. We're, we're ready. I'm going to pray and we're out of here. Um, but not until you drink all the decaf coffee. <laughs> well, I guess not, but now's where the agonizing work, the struggling in prayer, the connecting with people, the worshiping, the giving, and all the others that we didn't cover. Now's when it starts. Now's when it starts. This is when the work starts. When we walk out of these doors, will we be driven by Jesus in a greater way to, to commune with him and also to manifest him? And, and I pray that's everybody's um, goal for tonight. Father, thank you for the time that you've granted us uh, to meet with you. Thank you for the study that uh, we've now had. And Holy Spirit, thank you for leading and guiding us. Your promise was you'd take us into all truth. And I, I thank you for the blessing that we've received as small groups tonight to talk together on scripture and, and then for us to think God, where are we at right now in each of these disciplines, these spiritual means of having more of you in our lives? Oh, God, please, may we not just be slot machine Christians as we walk out of here tonight. Please direct us in how you want us to grow closer with you. And we know your promise is that as we do, you are drawing closer to us. Oh, God, may that be true until the day we see you face to face. We pray in your precious name. Amen.